All right, welcome to Beyond the Fundamentals. I hope you can hear me out there. And we have Debbie and Marsha again. We are talking about uh, Beulah Baptist Church in, what's it called, Winter Garden? Somewhere near Orlando? Yeah. Winter it's Garden. Like, what'd you say, it's, a, it's near Bush Gardens? <laughs> no, I don't know where. It, it's it's I'm close kidding. to the Orlando. I'm kidding. Um, so some folks may not know this, but uh, me and Debbie got to meet in person this weekend. Yes, it was awesome. Finally got to meet you. Somebody put in the comment section, is Kevin going to get shirts made up that say, I survived Calvinist Comic-Con 2024? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That was fun. We have uh, We have a few pictures here I want to share real quick. I just made a little collage. Well, I let PowerPoint make a collage for me. But uh, here we are right here. Yeah. Uh, me, you, and Richard. And then uh, there's a whole, there's a group of everybody that was there. We got to see uh, Alana and Hector and Elaine and James White was there. Got a little picture with him. Got to meet uh, Leighton Flowers in person. That was fun. And uh, here's Nick. Nick drove all the way from uh, uh, Connecticut, 15 hours. I thought uh -huh. my drive was long, awesome. eight hours. He drove 15 hours. And here we are sitting there listening to the best sermon we've ever heard in our life <laughs> right before the debate. We have smiles <laughs> on our faces. Oh, what was that? I said, we have smiles on our faces. Oh, I was, I don't know about I was having a blast. Yeah, it was fun. Um and and you know what I kind of got like just looking around, I felt like we were having more fun than anybody there. I think so. I think like so. our little group, you know? Yeah, I our little group. <laughs> everybody else was like, I'm serious and I hate God and all this stuff. And we're just like having a good time. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And it was so sweet. I just can't say enough for Alana and her husband. And Jason Breda and his wife and his mom welcoming welcoming us all over to the house, you know, just kind of a last minute yeah. thing, but it was so sweet. And it, um, I, um, you know, it was neat getting to meet um, Nick and Elaine. That was really fun. And then Caleb, a guy at the conference, yeah, um, the young gentleman. That was neat to meet him. And Lisa, one of Alana's friends, oh, I yeah. sat with her and talked with her at least a half hour. And what a blessing! I mean, yeah, I yeah, me too. So, so blessed by everybody. I spoke with uh, Lisa for quite a while, and uh, I really, very much enjoyed that conversation. Yeah, I'm trying yeah. to do right now is I'm trying to crop one of these pictures I put in here. Um, we, I'm, t I got the group photo here. I'm trying to zoom it out a little bit, so or zoom it in a little bit, so people can see a little better. Uh, the crew that we had and it was just a it was a blast and it was neat that nick uh, made you a little bingo oh my <laughs> a that little was so funny. Bingo that's game. right i sat next to kevin and he's sitting there playing playing his little calvinist bingo game <laughs> <laughs> tic tac calvinism is that what you call it you know what i'm gonna bring it up on my phone real quick it's somewhere over here not too far um Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, not sharing anymore. Yeah, but anyway, this here's a photo of everybody the at the Airbnb they were staying at. You can see uh, Jason over here and his wife Chelsea and and then the rest of the crew. It was a uh, it was a lot of fun being there. And, and Kevin, yeah. those kids were great. Did you notice the comparison of the kids? They they were very sweet. And... Like the kids at the Calvinist conference, they were like like they had been unparented or raised by yeah. wolves or something. Yes, yes. But then when we went over to Jason and Chelsea's Airbnb, these kids were just wonderful. And they were oh, so they much really fun were. and sweet. Yes, very much so. And Juliana just had to show me her flipping around. She can flip. <laughs> she can do flips with her dad. That was fun. So here's the yeah. bingo card, if anybody can oh, see that. Go. Uh, the bingo card that Nick made, he used <laughs> chat GPT and he generated several of these so that people would have different ones. So we're sitting there listening to Jeffrey Rice do his talk and we're checking off all the Calvinist talking points. Yeah. 
So what funny. did you win? <laughs> I did not get a bingo on this one because I had Infralapsarian taken up like one of the spaces that I needed to come across, and he never came out and quite said Infralapsarian. Uh, he never said sign out of Dort. Yeah, that would have gotten me one. There's one I missed. He said confessions. I was really shocked that he just came out and said bluntly that you need to have a foundation of covenant theology before you read the Bible. I, I caught that. <laughs> I'm like, I, I can't believe that they would just, I mean, obviously that's the problem, but for them to admit it and say that that's what they're doing. Yes. I told Debbie that was the one thing that was recorded that I got. That Say that again? That's, that's the one thing what? The part that was recorded that I got to listen oh, yeah. to. That was the one thing that stood out to me. Yeah, they came and uh, turned it. They told us to stop. So yeah. it's weird because I asked around. I was like, is this being live streamed anywhere? And they're like, no, it's not being live streamed. So I'm like, y'all okay if, if I uh, turn my phone on? Yeah, no problem. And apparently it became a problem. Yep. And a, said yeah. Yeah. A few minutes later, Jeff and Jeff Rice was the one. He's the one that reached out to me in June and not to take any, not to take any uh, thing away from Jason. Cause he did great. And I think everything happened exactly as it was supposed to, but he reached out to me in June and I was supposed to do the debate against James White. That's what they wanted. And uh, I'm like, yeah, let's do it a hundred percent. And then I, when it come, we were going to do predestination, and when it came to the scope, I was asking, I was asking a simple clarifying question about the scope. Are we talking about predestination of everything? Are we talking about soteriological predestination? And then when I asked that question, they just backed out. They're done. They didn't want to hear it. And they said, mm -hmm. and I said, uh, yeah. So I said, why is he backing out now? And he said, no, he's not backing out. He just doesn't want to debate somebody whose position is unclear. I'm like. My position's been online for six years. Um, so I, it wasn't that. I think, you you know, they have, I think James White has like prefabricated debate schemas that he does. Yeah. And he doesn't go outside that. You know, like little scripts or formulas. Kind of like systematic. Kind of like that. Yeah. Kind of like <laughs> systematic. <laughs> Uh, okay. We're in folder number seven. Yes. Yes. And we were a few minutes in. I think we were, mm, it's not the right video. We're there at seven, is. nine. Yes. What's that? Seven, nine? Yeah. Yes. Seven point nine. Oh, look at that. You're all over it. And good that like starting with seven on, I have these things labeled. Okay. So. I'm going to share my screen about what well, Okay. So we're talking about Beulah Baptist church. We've got two other videos before this, for those who are just joining us, two other videos before this, where we're talking about this church. So we're picking up where we left off. We're not going to do a whole lot of stuff on a review. Cause we just talked about this Calvinist conference. One day says, uh, Kevin, please let me know next time you attend the next debate. My wife and I will try to plan for it. Well, it just so happens in Houston on March 7th, we're going to see Layton and James White debate. I don't think this whole crew is going to be going there, but yeah. Jameson Haygood, who's been on the channel before, he's coming to pick me up, and we're going to it, and uh, I'm going to try to support Layton out there. Yeah. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, video, video time. Sharing sound. This is at 7.8, so we'll play this. Do you remember where we were? I but, think we finished with seven eight. Yeah, it's seven point nine. Yeah, but I just can't. It's all combined, and I don't have a. Oh. <laughs> okay. Before destruction, and in order that it might. If, if I go too far forward, it goes straight to seven point ten. Okay. That's my problem. That's what I'm trying to opt for here. There's seven point nine right there. Okay. Right at the end of seven eight. Call those who are not my people, my people. We could just read the whole rest of the chapter. All right, here we go. Propitiation Seven. is Jesus taking God's wrath in your place. The doctrine of propitiation is so beautiful. Even an innocent child who has not been saved is still a sinner needing salvation. And until they are saved, they are underneath the wrath of God. 
That's what total depravity means. Your comments. Yeah, so he was saying even an innocent child uh -huh. who has not been saved is still a sinner needing the salvation under the wrath of God. Mm -hmm. You know, and he's saying innocent child. So you can tell that he believes in total depravity, that we are guilty of Adam's sin from birth. So this innocent child thing, um, I have a problem with that. I do too. Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm going to tell you what the problem is. When you look in scripture, where am I? I'm going to share my screen again here. When you look in scripture, you come across passages like this. It says, um, Deuteronomy 139, moreover, your little ones. And this is when they were, you know, after Joshua and Caleb, and they had to go spend 40 years in the wilderness. You know, hey, you're going to go. But Joshua's going to lead them. Moreover, your little ones, which he said should be a prey. That means, you know, they thought the Canaanites were going to destroy their little ones, their kids. Yeah. And your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, yeah. and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. Now, in Nehemiah chapter 8, it divides some folks up. It's gathering the people together to speak to them. And I'm trying to see where it is. It's like before, okay, there it goes. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding mm -hmm. upon the first day of the seven month. So there's this distinction. We typically hear the phrase men, women, and children. And the way it's divided here is men, women, and they that could hear with understanding, which kind of implies kids that are old enough to understand. Mm -hmm. And also probably there might be some people who are infirmed or mentally challenged who could not understand and they might not be gathered either. But the idea is that kids are innocent and like the younger, younger, if they're too young to understand, they're not going to be held responsible for these things. Yeah. And you know, Paul said in Romans, he was not guilty of breaking the law till he knew the law. So a so, child until they know that they're a sinner and they're breaking God's law. Right. So the, the next one I want to go to, and I got like two more after this that I want to show, and then I'll, I'll shut up, but I just want to show these passages to people um, who are watching because the law worketh wrath for where no law is, there is no transgression. That's Romans chapter four, verse 15. Yeah. If you go to the very next chapter and I think it's chapter five, verse 13 or so for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you have um, Hebrews chapter five, probably around verse eight. Nope. Back it up. Not so much. There it is. So for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself is compassed with infirmity, which would include, um, you know, what would that include? I think it definitely would include people who are Ignorant, a, a child who can't understand would definitely be ignorant. Maybe uh, people with uh, who yeah, are mentally yeah. challenged yeah. might also be considered infirmed, and he has compassion on them. So this idea that a child, an innocent, he said innocent, he didn't just say child, he said an innocent child. Right. Yeah. It's not like sit well. Say again? So it sounds like a conflict with what he believes and what scripture says. Yeah, I totally agree He's with talking that. Talking on both sides. We have a video in case anybody is interested. It's on Psalm 58 3. 
and it's titled Wicked from the Womb, Calvinism versus Psalm 58.3. So that whole idea that Calvinists are preaching vipers and diapers. Matter of fact, I might share my screen real quick just to show. I, I haven't published this particular version of the website yet because it's under construction still. But this portion of the website is going to list all the videos that we have that address Calvinist proof texts. And I've only got like 10 here so far, but one of them here is Psalm 58, three wicked from the womb. Wow. And it talks about that issue and shows why that is not a scriptural uh, position. You know, didn't that one of the questions that James White dodged? Yeah, he, he did talk a little bit about that. But I think yeah, someone he, asked him. He basically, well, he ended up saying that he had, I think he said he had like three grandchildren that he had the privilege of leading to the Lord or baptizing. And then, but he says, he says when it gets, basically when it gets down to it, he just has to trust God. You know, basically. And then he said they'd all been catechized. It, when he said they'd all been catechized, I thought he was joking like something a Catholic would say. Yeah. <laughs> he said they'd all been catechized. Like, what? <laughs> but somebody asked him, like, you know, what do you Calvinists? I forget exactly what the question was. I think that might have been one of the ones that Lisa asked. Was yeah, it? it was Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. She, like, what do you Calvinists tell their kids? Yeah. Uh, do you sing Jesus Loves Me to your kids and stuff like that? Especially after Bailgate. And I felt like that question was kind of dodged. Yeah. Yeah. He basically at the end said he just has to leave it to God and trust God. They either dodge it or take you to another question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's right. Is uh, and he's pretty good at dodging and going to other mm -hmm. questions. Um, he asked questions when he was supposed to be answering questions, and when someone was giving an answer, he he would uh, tell them they were rambling. Yeah. yeah, I was I was not pleased with James White during that. He's very rude. His is very rude, and it wasn't even very subtle. Um. Are we ready for the next one? You got any com yes, more comments on that? Him. Okay. And we're showing videos of Casey Butner, who he denied being a Calvinist, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And this kind of stuff is stuff that only Calvinists would say. Bible believers would never say this. And this plane, I want you to know that God's grace through the doctrine of election has the purpose of... Anybody who says doctrine of election, they are definitely Calvinists. Saving sinners and sanctifying the saints, and it is not up to your merit. God did not choose based upon your merit. God chooses based upon whom he selects. And God's grace through the doctrine of election is not based on foreseen faith. God did not look through the sands of time to see who might choose him and select them. But it's interesting how whenever you start talking about the doctrine of unconditional election, the Calvinists will take that position of, well, doesn't God know everything? They will start talking that way, which is a good time to bring up London Baptist Confession, chapter 3, paragraph 2, which states that God did not foreordain anything because he foreknew it. So they will make arguments, they will make syllogistic arguments based off of what God knew and foreknew, even though in their own doctrine, it states very clearly that God did not decree anything because he foreknew it. Yeah. And, but the idea that God looked forward, like this is, this is, I'm going to pause. I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing just for a second and we'll get back to this, but this is basic um, Wesleyan Arminianism. And we here at Beyond the Fundamentals disagree with Wesleyan Armin we would disagree with Arminianism and Wesleyan Arminianism. And the idea is they they keep the framework of election and predestination as the Calvinists do. They just introduce the idea into election that Augustinian election is based on foreknowledge rather than foreknowledge that the person would have faith rather than it being unconditional. So that's the only difference between Arminian and Calvinist election, and it still re retains the Calvinist framework of election, that before the foundation of the world, certain ones were chosen to be converted, which there is no passage that says that. Right, right. So, yeah, so we very much disagree 
with the Armenian position. And what he's doing here is he is refuting the Wesleyan Armenian position, which we do not hold. Yeah, right. And now we'll continue playing the video now. Common misbelief, especially in the Baptist world. God doesn't need to wait and to see who will believe and select them. He doesn't look down through time to see who would believe. He's not dependent upon you. You do not have anything to do with that. If you did, listen how dangerous this is. If you did have something to do with your salvation, Paul addressed it in the book of Galatians, that Christ died needlessly. It took the blood of Christ not only to save the innocent little five-year-old girl, but it also took the same amount of blood to save the 50-year-old murderer. And so if you believe that somehow by your words you can speak and create a new heart, or you can do good works and do enough works and have enough merit to be good, then nullif you're nullifying the cross. It is by God's plan that you would be a gift to Christ as a believer. Read John chapter 17. It's a gift. You're a gift. You as a saved, sanctified... In John chapter 17, the gifts there are the apostles. The, mm -hmm. the world, we're taught, people who would believe today are talked about later in verses 19 through 21 glorified entity, a soul, you are a gift to Jesus and God has already foreordained it. And so God did not look down through time as if he is waiting to have an epiphany to see who would believe and then choose them. That's not true. From before the foundation of the world, God predestined us to be saved in Ephesians 1.4. 4. And also God's grace through the doctrine of election is very consistent with man's free will. First Timothy 2, 1 to 4 talks about how God... And this is typical compatibilism. Yeah. It's yeah. consistent with man's free will. This is called compatibilism, all right? And so the London Baptist Confection, Confession does have free will in it. They because you'll So you'll hear a Calvinist say, oh, we believe in free will, but they do not believe in um, free free will. Yeah. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm going to stop my video for a second while I grab this uh, book because it's it's relevant. Um, they believe in non-free free will, and then they <laughs> modify free will and consign everybody else to like this modified version of free will. So Ken Wilson's doctoral dissertation. Augustine's conversion from traditional free choice to non-free free will. <laughs> so when they talk about believing in free choice, it's a, it's another word game. It's yeah. another double speak, just like everything else a Calvinist does. It's equivocation, gaslighting, all that. Kevin, um, in the, the first ahead. class, the, in the first class at the conference that my husband and I went into, um, I forget his first name was Sam you know, was saying, well, we believe man has a free will, otherwise it's fatalism. But he says, we just have a different different definition than the world does. Ours is biblical. And it's compatible with the T, with, you know, total depravity. So, so this, this is, is more biblical. This is a good opportunity. So he crossed several lines here. He talked about election, then he's talking about total depravity at the same time, which Calvinist doctrines do cascade one from another. So they can't be they can't you can't draw neat division lines between them because they rely on each other. They are a they cascade from the source premises and not from scripture, by the way. But I I'm strong I have to strongly advocate to non Calvinists do not argue for free will. Yeah. Because you're going down a philosophical rabbit hole and the the like fourth rate philosophy is the Calvinist territory in order to overcome the Calvinist. Do not argue for free will, just argue for scriptural authority. Yeah. And there are, a, there are a few passages that I recommend that people bring up to argue for scriptural authority and hear me, hear me well, do not argue for free will argue for scriptural authority. And the first one I would tell people to bring up is Romans chapter 5, verse 2. It says, by whom we have access by faith into this grace, 
wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory. The Calvinists believe we have access by grace into faith. Read their statements. You can even read the Southern Baptist faith and message that grace is what brings about faith. That is unscriptural. We have access by faith into this grace. When he's saying not any merit, if we contribute anything to our salvation, then that the blood of Christ is just worth nothing. When he's saying all that, it is, if you take Romans 4, 5, what they're doing is this. The Bible contrasts works with faith, right? Yeah. But to him that worketh not, but justifieth, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Here, Scripture very clearly separates works from faith. If you listen to a Calvinist and you connect the dots on what they're saying, they are making faith a work by which you cannot be saved. So one of the five solas is sola fide, which means only faith. They don't actually believe that. Oh, it put my hand up for me. Did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> they recognized that I was raising my hand. <laughs> they, <laughs> Zoom did. They they don't believe in sola fide. They they their actual teaching is that faith is a work. So if you look at Paul's definition, so that's Romans four. All you have to bo- do is back up to verse twenty eight. And we see what his definition of works is. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That's what he means by works. What a Calvinist means by works is faith. They they teach. And what he was doing right there, and we'll probably keep doing when we play the video more, that faith replaces, uh, that faith is a work. Yeah, And if you are relying on the fact that you put your faith in Christ for Christ to save you, then you are essentially believing in work salvation. In their doctrines, even in the Southern Baptist faith and message, I was just reading it today, and it says that regeneration is an act that man responds to in faith and repentance. That is not scriptural. Now, they'll make it sound very uh, sanctimoniously, morally bloviated that you're immoral or not thankful or elevating yourself above God if you don't put regeneration first. We're simply putting Scripture first. So the first passage I would give people is Romans 5.2. We have access by faith into this grace, not the other way around. I like to take people to first uh, to Ephesians chapter five, uh, 1, verse 13. Very clear, in whom ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, after you believed. Mm -hmm. That's not me, that's the Bible. Going back to Romans chapter 10, verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession, confession is made into salvation, not the other way around. Um, one more of these, which is a big one, really two more because it's connected to another. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, it says, It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. What Calvinists actually believe is that God causes belief in those that he saved. That's exactly what the Baptist Southern Baptist Faith and Measures 2000 says, that yeah. you respond to regeneration. But if you look over in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, which we heard uh, Saturday, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the holy ghost well he saved how who did he save he saved those that believe Mm -hmm. he does not Mm -hmm. save those that aren't believing then make them believe belief is very clearly a prerequisite and so what i try to emphasize to people is that it is not about free will do not argue for free will Argue for scriptural authority every single time. Only argue for scriptural authority. And I always have people push back on that. Oh, but 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 free will, we have to argue for free will. No, you don't. No, you don't. 
all you have to argue for is scriptural authority. And in scripture, it's very clear that people must believe before God will regenerate them. Also, so they want to push you into arguing yep. that. And also they want to push you into thinking it's unfair. Again, they're yeah. wanting to dismantle you so they can be correct. And right. So, so pushing you in that direction. It's a little judo move. They want you to argue that it, God's being unfair. And then they will give you the prison analogy. Mm -hmm. It's not about whether or not God's fair. It's about whether or not, again, whether or not Romans eleven thirty two is true. It's about whether or not Hebrews, you know, he granted he gave mercy to all in Romans eleven thirty two. He gave yep. himself a ransom for all, first Timothy two six. It's not about whether or not it's fair. It's about whether or not what God said is true. That's our only concern. Now, if God said, I hate most of humanity and I want to condemn them to hell, and I'm only offering salvation to a pre-selected few that I've chosen before the foundation of the world, that would be very easy for him to say. Our only problem with that is that God didn't say that. I, mean, I just said it. Surely God can say it. Surely I don't have an ability that God doesn't have, right? Right. If God, if that's what happened, God could have said it. Well, he doesn't say that anywhere. Hey, you know, Kevin, there is a man that rejected a pardon from the president. So I love yeah. it when they give me that little scenario about the prison. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he could, you could reject the pardon. Yeah, and there is a man in history that did reject it. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And they yeah. said, you, you have the right to give them a pardon, but they don't have to accept it. Yeah. So I love it when they come up with that. So the prison analogy, and I, you've, you can hear the prison analogy. I've heard it from R.C. Sproul. I've heard it from, what's the guy who looks like a sad face all the time? Uh, Paul Washer. I mean, you hear it from all the Calvinists. They they yeah. always they, they basically say, well, if there's ten prisoners who all deserve to go to the electric chair because they all did horrible things, uh, and the warden comes out and pardons three of them, he doesn't owe a pardon to the other seven. So we're not we're not saying that he owes anything or that it's unfair. We're not. The problem is the scenario is wrong. In the biblical yeah. scenario, mercy is offered to all and some reject it. That's the yeah. biblical scenario. It's not about fairness. Yeah. Once they start giving you a story out of the scripture, right there, you ought to realize you're going in the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. I want, you know, speaking of this thing, I want to give, I want to bring up another passage that they constantly bring up for this issue with regard to, um, if you contributed anything to your salvation, the Calvinists love to quote uh, John 1 13 out of context, which I shouldn't have to say mm -hmm. out of context because anytime a Calvinist is quoting pa a passage, it's out of context. So in Roman in John 1 11, he came unto his own and his own received him not, which would make me ask, uh, if they were his own and they didn't receive him in which way were they his own? Mm -hmm. they like to quote verse 13 which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of god but what they overlook is verse 12 but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of god even to them that believe on his name so believing on his name is how to receive him okay right after you believe on his name, you are given the power to become the sons of God. And then you are born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Yeah. So receiving Christ, and whether whether or not a person puts free will in that, doesn't matter. That's just the text of Scripture. And again, yet you, we argue the text of Scripture, not for free will. Do not argue for free will if you're listening to this. A video, you argue for scriptural authority. Yeah, there. So for those who receive Christ, those are the ones who are born again by the will of God, born of God by the will of God after they receive Christ. But you have to receive Christ first. Why do I believe that? Not because I'm worshiping the pagan goddess of free will, just because I think scripture is true. That's the only reason. And if you believe in Calvinism, 
it's because you don't think scripture is true. That's the, that's the problem with Calvinism. You know, Kevin, it's interesting the way he talks about sovereignty as if you could erase the cross that I could do anything that could affect what Christ did. Mm-hmm. You know, the way he says that, well, if you believe this, you have removed the death of Christ. And I'm going, there's not anything that any, cr- any person could do that could dim- dismantle anything that God's done. What Christ did affects us. Well, that us. that brings us to the whole the whole crux of the debate that mm-hmm. was fr- uh, Saturday, and the problem with both sides is that everybody thinks that the the atonement has to do with salvation, and the pro the the fact of the matter scripturally is that the atonement is a has a much broader scope than mm-hmm. anyone's salvation. The atonement is cosmic in scope. And I actually plan on doing a, a separate video on this. But when when the devil came to tempt Jesus, he was offering him all the kingdoms of the world. These will be yours if you, you know, come give in to my temptation. And Jesus is like, no, I don't think so, buddy. And so when Jesus dies, if you look at Colossians 1.20, the atonement is actually it's it's the blood price for the title deed to the entire cosmos. And our salvation is just an itty bitty part of the huge scope achieved by the atonement. And since Christ owns everything, he as sovereign God can set the parameters for who he will save. And he has set the parameters. He will save those that believe. Mm-hmm. That those are his parameters. So I get kind of upset. I have this book here. This is Adam Harwood's book, right? He's a not a Calvinist. And the provisionists love this book. And and it's uh I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna point out something that annoys me a little bit here. There's this question in here, and I have my finger on it right there. I don't know if you can see it, but it's, it's um it says, What was Christ? saving purpose in the atonement and you see that sentence right there what was christ's saving purpose in the atonement and my question is why is the word saving in there aren't you answering the question in the asking of it aren't you saying that saving was the purpose of the atonement you see what i'm saying it's got it's got and that's the the whole mindset with both the calvinists and the provisionists is they have such a limited view a limited unscriptural view of what the atonement is it's not just about salvation it's about everything and christ has the title deed to everything and he can save based on the parameters that he sets it's his prerogative and if he decides that he's only going to save those that believe that's his prerogative yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, Someone God's says, bound by his word. It says that in Psalms. Yeah. They, wanna, they want to throw all these extra words in there. It's really funny because he goes, yeah, he keeps saying like dangerous. Yeah, it's dangerous. very dangerous. Yeah. You know, when he starts adding all these adjectives to his word, it's almost to incite fear in you not to go against the word of God and the scripture authority, but to go against him mm-hmm. is what he's trying to date yeah. you with. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I just want to, I can't emphasize that enough. And that's why I, I think it's worth the time to emphasize to people where we lose ground. We cede territory to Calvinists. Yeah. Every, if you argue for free will, and you win that argument, you just ceded that territory to them. And we just, what did you cede to them? No scriptural authority. Yeah. It's It cannot be on a philosophical stance about free will or fairness. And that's, that's the one thing that defeating Calvinism is easy. You only need one argument. There's only one argument you ever need to defeat Calvinism. That is scripture's true and go to the relevant passage and you can, for every passage, you can show in every single passage how it does not support Calvinism. 
And that's the only argument. Scripture's true, Calvinism isn't. That's the only reason we reject it. Not because of free will, not because of fairness, not because because they have all these things that they think we reject Calvinism for. Oh, it's repulsive to me. I just can't believe God would be such a monster. My God is just so much more loving. And and God, you know, I believe in free will, and it's just not fair that God would do. That's what they think non-Calvinists are. That is their mental image of a non-Calvinist. And they even said this, like, like Brad Saab came on to Leighton Flowers' channel and said that's that was what he thought of non-Calvinists. And Leighton even said that's what he thought of non-Calvinists before he left Calvinism. He didn't realize that there were actual scriptural reasons you can't be a Calvinist if you think scripture's true. And so I got to emphasize over and over and over to everybody that's listening, do not argue for free will or fairness or that makes God a monster, and my God's a loving God, none of that stuff. Scripture's true. That's the only argument, and that is the only thing that will put it to bed. And if you are not, if you are arguing for anything other than that, you are perpetuating Calvinism. Is that clear enough? Did I say that clear? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Very good. All right. where if you don't believe Scripture, you're on shaky ground, you know? Yeah, and um, it, there's scripture that says that you're blown by every wind of doctrine. Wind of doctrine. That's Ephesians so chapter four, verse fourteen, yeah, tossed so about by every wind of doctrine. Yeah, yeah. So your authority is the word of God. So if you believe Calvinism, why would you have to have a conference called Why Calvinism if you really believed it was biblical? If you really believed Calvinism was biblical. All you'd have to do is distribute Bibles. Yeah, yeah. But the Bible does not spread Calvinism. No. Apostate men spread Calvinism. And that's the only way that it spreads. Yeah. Through and when books. they have this go ahead. <laughs> Through books, conferences. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's always the writings of men. Yeah. You have that's to write a nine Marx books, and you have to have the founders because the Bible won't get you Calvinism. Yeah. And each class, Kevin, it seemed like it got down to God's sovereignty as in determinism and the T and Tulip, you know, yep. totally depraved. It's like mm -hmm. if you didn't have those, then it all fell apart. It does. It does. And it's, it's interesting that you would say that because total depravity is, is the bill is the starting building block of Calvinism. Historically, that is the initial seed thought from which the rest of Calvinism necessarily cascades. But um, God's sovereignty is the starting point of the presentation of Calvinism to others. So mm -hmm. like in a in an organization, you have like front-facing front and rear-facing data. You have internal and external data. When you have front-facing data, it's stuff the whole public can get to. So like internally, yeah, it's all structured around total depravity. It's structured on a philosophical view of the human will, which is man-centered theology. It's only in the presentation of it to the outside that they start with God's sovereignty. But God's sovereignty cascaded from the presumption of total depravity. Mm -hmm. So it's the starting point of the narrative. It's not the starting point of the system. It's not the building. Total depravity is the cornerstone of their system. God's sovereignty is the cornerstone of how it's presented to others. Mm -hmm. It's the cover story, really. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting that you that you picked those two because that's exactly what's happening. It boils down to those two. Yeah, each class, that's what I, listening to it, that's what I thought with each one of them, each class. Well, you know, I don't know how you can have hyper-Calvinist because if you believe in the T, you're totally depraved, you're unable, God would have to call you out of the grave you would have to believe that the others are going to hell if you weren't called out of the grave. Yeah. So me, to me, the whole thing is, is a problem there. If you believe total depravity, then you are a hyper Calvinist, no matter well, if you want to agree with it or not. So what we say, what we say is a, a hyper Calvinist. Those are the only consistent Calvinists. Yeah. You're compatibilists exactly. who say, Oh, and, Free will and God's sovereignty go together. We don't understand how. It's a mystery. And if you try to understand how, you're elevating yourself above the wisdom of God. Just, it's not our job to figure these things out. It's our job to just believe them. 
Yeah. That's, that's, well, hyper Calvinists will say what they believe. <laughs> you know, my brother got his doctorate from R.C. Sproul, and they were having a Jeff? debate one more one day before class. Before Jeff Parker, RC. your brother? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so they were having a debate before um, R.C. came in the room, and these Baptists, these naive Baptists, were saying, "Well, we don't believe you're chosen before salvation." For hell, and they just kept having all this big debate. So R.C. Sproul walks in, and he goes, "Help us out here!" And you know that smile he gives because he he believes what he <laughs> believes, you know. And um, he looked at him, and he goes, "Surely." He goes, "If you believe in tea, that's exactly what you believe, and if you don't, you're not a Calvinist." Yeah, <laughs> so that's absolutely right. Believe, huh? That's absolutely right. Yeah. So that's everything what hinges on the tea. Yeah. And people don't get that. They think, oh, it hinges on sovereignty. And even people that I love and respect, you know, like Doug Gustafson comes on here and he's like, it all hinges around sovereignty. I'm like, and I'm not going to argue with him because Doug's great, but um, it, that's that's really the presentation of it is sovereignty like that. And that's the cover story. But if God was sovereign, he would not have to implement, if God was sovereign, even meticulous determined, determinism, that doesn't, Calvinism doesn't necessarily cascade from that. He could choose to be true. He could true to he could choose to be true instead of Calvinist. But they think that because he's meticulous determinism sovereignty, that he's that that means he has to be Calvinist instead of true. Yeah. You know, to me, these people that don't want to believe that total depravity equals hyper Calvinism, these are people that are closet. They want to stay in the closet. They don't want to really agree with the horrific. Um, outcome of what they believe. But I need to tell you something. My brother got his doctrine under R.C. Sproul, and he is not a Calvinist. Yeah. So I need to make that very clear. Yeah. Well, um, for those who may not know, um, yeah, Jeff Parker came on our, he came on this channel. Well, he didn't come on the channel, but he let us re-air his video. So his he has had a presence on this channel. Are you familiar with what a Russell conjugation is? No. Okay. It's Bertrand Russell. And that is, um, it's the way you say things like, um, a woman might say, Oh, you're sweaty, but I perspire. Mm -hmm. You see, and here's mm -hmm. a, a couple more examples. Um, I am sparkling. You are unusually talkative. He is drunk. Okay. There's three different ways to word things. Here's another. I know my own mind. You like things to be just so they have to have everything their own way. You see this. Each one yeah. gets worse as it goes. Yeah. I am a freedom fighter. You are a rebel and he is a terrorist. Mm -hmm. They all say that mm -hmm. this is say in reverse order when you're talking to somebody else. They're saying the same thing. I am eccentric. You are weird. He is mad. Huh. I am righteously indignant. You are annoyed. And he is making a fuss over nothing. I have reconsidered the matter. Or you have changed your mind. You see, there's different ways to word things. that, And what, what the Calvinist likes to do is they like to employ Russell conjugations to make things not seem as bad as they are. Yeah. Because yeah. Calvinism is pretty terrible. It's yeah, a pretty horrible yeah. reality. I yeah. just saw somebody on Facebook. They had no idea their pastor was Calvinist. This last Sunday, their pastor preached a Calvinist sermon, and they're just devastated. They never heard this before, and that's not what they thought of God. They're just devastated. Calvinism is absolutely horrible. But yeah. the reason Calvinists have to write so much, there's two reasons. One of it is technical debt because... There's so many contradictions in Calvinism itself and between Calvinism and Scripture that they have to talk around uh, trying to iron those out or figure out a way to look at it to where the contradiction goes away, you know, which it really mm -hmm. doesn't, which winds up with all the doublespeak. And then the other reason is because they're they're worried about wording things in such a flowery way to make it more palatable, right? Yeah. And it's really, you could say it plainly, Calvinism is awful. 
or but they like to say God and His grace and mercy yeah. is coming, and those that are the child, the daughters of Zion will choose their king. You know, see how sanctimonious that sounds. Mm -hmm. They like to dress it up and make it pretty. They're all Russell conjugations to hide the fact that Calvinism is just absolutely terrible. Yeah, and when you say it like it is, yeah. they don't like it at all. Yeah, again, they say you butter. don't understand Calvinism. Yeah, it's the peanut butter on the dog peel. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, or putting it in bologna. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly. And like dogs, people fall for it. I go there. It goes that peanut butter again. <laughs> There's another another one. Is like you might say, "Oh, you're so passionate," and what they mean is, "Oh, you're so biased." You know, yeah. and so there's all kinds of um, he, one one guy is um, you can, he's persistent, he's stubborn and he's a pig headed fool, you know, that that kind of thing. And so Calvinism is really the art of making terrible things sound better. Yeah. And when you don't pursue that art, you get accused of not understanding Calvinism. But I I, and I really think like. When it comes to hyper Calvinism, if you do believe in the T and total depravity, just like you said, Marcia, you really do. To be consistent, you would have to be a hyper Calvinist. But yeah. I really think that there are some Calvinists out there who have fooled themselves into thinking that compatibilism isn't the stupidest thing they've ever heard of. Yeah, like it's viable yeah. or plausible. Absolutely, it's it's not at all. But I think they've actually convinced themselves. You have to. Calvinism comes from a crossover of a high amount of zeal and a low amount of cognitive capacity. Yeah. And that's why they don't catch those things. And they think that you don't understand it when you do. Yeah. Well, they're deceived. <laughs> yeah, very much so. <clears throat> yeah. Externally and internally. I didn't mean, yeah. I feel like I cut you off about 12 times. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good conversation. Mm -hmm. So if I, so if you were trying to say something, I cut you off. Um, no, you said you said it perfectly. I mean, again, when I go to say that, people will turn, cut me off and say, you don't know what you're talking about. Hyper Calvin is, oh, no, I'm not hyper. I believe, you know, in the five points, it's biblical, it's scripture, just like Casey's saying. Yeah. Here. So, yeah. But anyway, you get right. good. Thank you. So yeah, so I would encourage people in the audience, look up Russell conjugations and learn how to spot them when they're being employed. Okay? Mm -hmm. And it's also a way of framing things as well. And get you some peanut butter and crackers, <laughs> Ritz crackers, and eat them while you're just studying it. Yeah. <laughs> and get them stuck <laughs> on the roof of your mouth when you can't swallow the pill. Um, Where are we here? 7-Eleven. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to keep playing. I don't think we finished seven ten quite yet. Oh, okay. Yeah, finished the other nope, one. I hit the wrong button. I turned off my screen, which um might be a salve to the eyes for some people. Here we go. I'm going to keep playing this one. Stop whenever you want to make a comment. God wants all people to be saved. And so the responsibility... I'm going to back that up a little bit just for context. Uh, we're at 1643, so I'm going to back it up to, say, 1625, good, so we can hear that statement. And also, God's grace through the doctrine of election is very consistent with man's free will. There's First no Timothy 2, 1 to 4, talks about how God wants all people to be saved. And so the responsibility to repent and believe is there upon us. Here we see that God's grace is not only consistent with all of the Word of God, it is consistent with God's justice. And I want to drive this point home one more riveting time. Riveting. What did you say? We're talking about riveting. One more riveting time. Yeah. And very, we got to put very yeah. in front of there. Very consistent. Yeah consistent That's can't gaslighting. Can't it yeah. it's completely inconsistent <laughs> and they think standing behind a pulpit borrowing god's power to say things that aren't true people believe it for ash conformity reasons speaking of riveting I, the green screen behind me is held up by rivets i have a riveting gun it's like the most economical way to do it all right here we go this is consistent with god's justice election deals with the condemned, those who will be rightfully punished for eternity in hell. And the fact that anyone is saved is by God's grace and mercy. The fact that anybody is saved is a... He's alluding to the prison analogy there. Mm -hmm. 
because yeah. God's grace and mercy. Like everyone deserves to go to hell. If you want fair, everyone goes to hell. It's God's grace and mercy that nobody doesn't. Well, we're not talking about grace and mercy. We're talking about whether or not God's a liar when he right. said his mercy goes to all in Romans eleven thirty two. 32. Matter of God's kindness, it's pure grace. There is no injustice to God. But if you do not believe that, if you do not believe in God's sovereign grace, you are in fact grace doesn't need a modifier by the way there's grace in the bible the word the word sovereignty doesn't even appear in the bible much less sovereign grace indicting god sustain see see that more that's moralism again yeah yeah if you yeah. don't believe in god's sovereign grace you are indicting god you're yeah. blaming god right. that's a moral framing we call it non epistemic ranking criteria on this channel where you use a moral way to frame things to get people to believe a particular truth claim that is not epistemically viable. Yeah. And epistemic, people, somebody asked me, what does epistemics mean? Ep epistemology is the, it's, it's related to the Greek word for pistis is faith, how we believe, faith, believe, pistis. And uh, when you say the epistle of James, it's they all have similar root words. Epistemology is the science of how we come to know things or how we come to believe them is true. What is the threshold that it would take to convince me that something is true? The su the study of that is called epistemology. Well, if something is worth, if a truth claim like his version of God's sovereign grace. If that is true, then it will have epistemic reasons for it. If it's not true, he's going to use moral reasons. Well, yeah. if you don't believe this, you're indicting God. That's yeah. not an epistemic argument. That's a moral argument. Yeah. It's getting on the sanctity degradation moral. <laughs> I hope that's not too much for somebody, but there's six moral foundations like care, harm, liberty, freedom, that kind of thing. And um, one of them is sanctity degradation. So they're playing on that moral foundation to convince people to accept this truth claim of their version of God's sovereignty so that they aren't indicting God. Right. And the fear of indicting God in this argument is what would push somebody into Calvinism, not epistemic soundness or epistemic merit. Yeah, don't dare argue with them. Didn't Abraham and Moses both talk back to God and um, become, yeah. you know, and here they try to make it sound like if you talk back to God, you are just a hypocrite. You're, yes. you're a heretic. You're a, who are you, old man? They like yeah, to quote yeah, that. You are, nothing about nine. you is good. All right. Uh, Resharing. And, and I love doing this because we are using what a Calvinist is saying. We are assessing them by their own words. Yeah, yeah, when you yeah. when when I talk about Calvinism, people sometimes there are you Calvinists who believe that you're making stuff up. We're just took, taking what they say. This is what yeah, a Calvinist right. is saying. That's right. what we're reacting to. Yeah. Here we go. Just ground. You are in fact accusing God of injustice. Moral argument, not an epistemic argument, and it's wrong. We're just, we're accu he's accusing God of it, of lying if Calvinism is true, and that's that is an epistemic argument because I'm talking about what the text says, yeah. and he yeah. is presenting a truth claim that disagrees with what the text says. Yeah. And in Romans chapter nine, it makes it very clear that you're on shaky ground. Turn there with me. I want you to see how you cannot. We want to make a prediction. He's going to go to the who are you, old man? Yeah. Let's make a prediction. <laughs> well, I'm going to watch these videos. Ground. Yep. We're on shaky ground, Kevin. In Hold yourself. On. Shaky ground. And we're not, see, we're, we're, they make it sound like we're questioning God when we question Calvinism. Do you realize yeah. that sleight of hand there? When you question Calvinism, they will go to who are you to question God? I didn't question God. I'm the one believing God. Yeah. You're the one questioning God and putting Calvinism in God's place. I'm questioning you, fool, not God. Right. I'm believing God. You're the one that's not. They put themselves in the place of God yeah, in yeah. order to, to go to Romans 9.23, who are you to question God? They're putting themselves in the place of God when they're the ones denying God and we're yeah. the ones believing him. Right. All right, get fired up about this stuff because it's, 
that so the the Just moralistic way. component yeah. is mm-hmm. so deceptive and so persuasive with Christians who want to be morally right in the eyes of God. So this this is a effective shaping operation to get people to lean into Calvinism for moralistic reasons. And it's just absolute hogwash. Kevin, we've got one video coming up. We may have to ask some people to leave the room. It's so bad. Okay. Just hang on there. Hang on to the emotions. All right. Coming up soon to a screen near you, a, room, a video you may not be able to stomach. All right. Mm-hmm. Let's um, see if we can keep going with this one. Indict God of being unjust by selecting some and not selecting others. That is not what the doctrine. And remember, that's why that's not our argument. Yeah. We don't. Yeah. We're not saying God is unjust for selecting some and not selecting others. We're just saying that that's not what the text says. Right. Yeah, that's correct. So he's he. So they're believing something the Bible doesn't say, and then they're trying to put the burden of proof over on us and make people feel moralistically guilty for disagreeing with them. Yeah. See, you see what a narcissistic twist that is. Yeah, it's so, and remember, so shady. And remember, Kevin, in the first video, how we were showing what he believed in 2016. Yeah. God didn't choose just some. Yeah, he, I guess and he was indicting God. That would be unkind to do right. so. Yeah, and now he's being <laughs> kind by at least just choosing one. I would like for him to set one child suffer tonight and tell the other two kids, "Now you watch your sibling eat and be joyful about it." Be glad that they have some food. <laughs> wow. So that, that you just mixed uh, Calvinism and, and communism in one sentence. That was impressive and 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 accurate. <laughs> all right, here we go. Salvation is all about. It is about the kindness of our God saving some so that they would be saved. This is dangerous. So, so I want to, um, I do want to stop and talk about this for a second because I came up with a, it, it, when I was driving to Tennessee, this phrase occurred to me. Calvinism is malevolence described as religion. Yeah. And what I mean by that, you might, you might be tempted to think that I'm talking about God being this wicked, horrible monster. I'm not talking about that at all. What I'm talking about, well, it's kind of related, but what I'm talking about is the Calvinist preacher under the guise of religion gets to be malevolent toward people. You saw James White. In the name of religion, he gets to be malevolent toward Jason Breda and justify it before religious moralistic reasons. You see? So, and what he's doing here, what this guy is doing here, he is pigeonholing weak-minded people because you have to be weak-minded to become Calvinist. He's pigeonholing weak-minded people moralistically into a Calvinistic way of thinking. If they're falling for this, I don't know that they are. All right. They might be, you know, they might not have a bunch of mentally ill people in the audience. You never know. But in doing so, he is that control over people is a malevolent tendency that you can use Calvinism to put a pretty dress on your malevolence, but you keep being malevolent now in the name of religion. It is malevolence disguised as religion. That's what Calvinism is. And in the way that it's played out between the people, not, and I'm not talking about the depiction of God, even though it plays out that way because they want to become like their malevolent God because you don't we all want to become like in the image of Christ? Well, mm-hmm. if your image of Christ is like malevolence toward a majority of the population of humanity, you're going to become that way too. But yeah. you're going to exercise your malevolence in this sly, sleek, clever way of of manipulating people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, going back to our video... Yeah, I I would say I would apologize for talking so much, but these are such good points to bring up straight from their own lips. Yeah, no, you're good. Ground. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 9, verse 20, on the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? 
The thing molded, will it not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have the right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and the other for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did also so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he has also called, not from among Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. Folks, let me tell you. He just stumbled across the reason Romans 9 was really written, which was to tell the Jews that they aren't the few select that's been chosen by God. It's actually open to everybody. Yeah. That's yeah. the point of Romans 9. And the Jews didn't like that. Right. And the Calvinists don't like that. The Jews are the Calvinists are repeating the same error that the Jews yeah. had. They want it to be us for and no more. That's not the way that it works. What the Calvinist likes to do, I'm going to show you two passages of scripture here. What the Calvinist likes to do is, first of all, they will talk about their doctrine of unconditional election. So now your mind is framed to see things in that way. The right. correct framing of Romans 9 is not election, it's Acts 15. That's the controversy that's being dealt with. Yeah. So what they will do is they will they want to quote um, Romans chapter 9, verse like 16 and 18, right? So it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Remember that word mercy? Yeah. Verse 18. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. And then they will say, after they've framed things Calvinistically, yeah. who hath resisted his will, Nabod, O man, um, who are thou that repliest against God? Who are you to question God? Yeah. Well, let, now let's do it a different way. Okay, he has mercy on whom he will have mercy. Let's show the Calvinist Romans 11.32. And say, God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, then thou wilt say unto me, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who are thou that repliest against God? It's, it's high time we turn this around on them and show them that they are the ones not believing in Scripture. Yeah. Romans 11.32, uh, some people, especially if you're a Calvinist, may not count very well. Calvinists don't typically recognize that Romans keeps going after chapter 9, right? There are more chapters after chapter 9. You have to remind Calvinists of this because they seem to not know that. And if you, what you should do in the Bible is keep reading. Don't stop in chapter 9, keep reading. Romans 11.32 is the point that all of this is getting to. Yeah. And so, yeah, he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And who does he have mercy on? All. And the ones who deny that are the ones that are questioning God. And the Calvinists, like, when you question their doctrine, they treat you like you're questioning God. They are putting themselves and their great giants of the faith in the place of God, man-centered religion, and then they talk to you like you're questioning God when you're questioning them. Yeah. It's yeah. the most twisted, narcissistic, gaslighting, equivocating, word-splicing game. Yeah. It's just so horrible. It's so horrible that humans can stoop so low that they can talk this way and still go to sleep at night and be able to go to the grocery store without adult supervision. These people ought to have uh, house arrest ankle brace bracelets on. If so they're, if they're okay people, talking this way. Yeah. Oh. A lot of people don't um, know that there's another way to read Romans 9. Right, that's yeah, true. You don't know it, and then you have somebody like that telling you that you say, oh, yeah, well, look, that's what it says. Who are you to question? Who are you yeah. So it's very important for them to frame things in Calvinistic terms before you read the text. And yeah. then you once it like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And you yeah, can't unsee, definitely. you can't go back to the context. But what's really happening is back to Romans Acts 15. The Jews are upset 
that Gentiles are now allowed to get mm -hmm. saved without becoming a Jew first. Right. Up through Acts 7, it's all Jews and Jewish proselytes. In, in other words, if a Gentile was going to get saved and trust in Jesus Christ, they first had to be a proselyte, and then they could trust in the Jewish Messiah, because after all, it's the Jewish Messiah, and you first have to be a Jew before you can trust in the Jewish Messiah. That's what's going on in Acts 1 through 7. Then when Cornelius gets saved in Acts chapter 10, and then in Acts 15, when they decide that all Gentiles can get saved, nobody has to go through the gateway control anymore of circumcision and keeping the law or becoming a Jew, the Jews just lost their control. And now it's free, wide open, willy-nilly. They don't like that. And Romans 9 is correcting them on that. Yeah. Salvation is open to everyone, and that's what they don't like. Yeah. And um, Kevin, what really helped me with that too was um, Jeremiah 18 when it's talking about the yep. potter and the clay. And then in, um, what is it, 2 Second Second Timothy, Timothy 2, 20 and 2, 21. 21. Yeah. You know, we determine what vessel we're going to be. Not God isn't. Yeah, if a man therefore will purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified yeah. unto all good works and meet for the master's use. Yeah. That's what should be done. And then uh, Jeremiah 18, God has the power to to remake a vessel better than it was to begin with. That's right. Upon the repentance of the people in question. Right. Yeah. The clay had become marred in the potter's hand. Yeah. It wasn't God that marred them. It was they yeah. became marred. They became marred. Yeah. So, um, yeah, a little Bible clear up a lot of Calvinism. Yeah, that's that's all it takes. You want to clear up Calvin? A little bit of Bible will do that, and that's why they have these Calvinistic conferences. Instead of instead of passing out Bibles, they have to talk about Calvinism. And you know what they're doing? If you have a if you have a conference called Why Calvinism, you know why you're doing that is because they feel insecure about the validity of Calvinism inside their body. They have anxiety about it. And this, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a little psychology here, but that's what's happening. And since I have anxiety and I feel insecure about the validity of Calvinism, then I'm going to have a big Calvinist conference. I'm going to surround myself with, I'm going to, I'm going to bolster the walls of my Calvinist echo chamber and just reverberate Calvinism for a whole weekend. Mm -hmm. And that's going to relieve my anxiety of realizing that Calvinism is not a viable system of thought. And yes, it is dying. That is a sign of a system in its death throes. That's a mm -hmm. sign that this paradigm is in its senescence and it's trying to get its last strong straw, trying to hold itself together. Mm -hmm. All right. I talk a lot, don't I? <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Good. Yeah. yeah, it's good. <laughs> It's just, uh, I mean, it's, it's, oh, the way people think about this. It is God's active work to save. It is not his active work to condemn to hell. His active work is reaching into a condemned humanity and saving those whom he elects. Sounds like he never read Matthew chapter 7. So God's active work is only to save. His active work is not to destroy. Praise God that he saves anybody. Well, let's let's flesh that out logically. If if unconditional election is true, okay. Now this goes back to what you were saying, Marsha, about a consistent Calvinist, uh, a hyper Calvinist. Okay, so what a compatibilist will do, like an inconsistent Calvinist, they teach that God elected some for salvation and passed over the other ones, yeah. right? Well, there, there's a such thing called a seven-point Calvinist, and yeah. one of those seven points is called equal ultimacy. Yeah. And what that means is that just as God chose some for saving, he is also equally choosing the other ones for damning. And yeah. that's only logical. I mean, yeah. you think God doesn't recognize the consequences of that action? So they try to use a Russell conjugation instead of God predestinating some for hell that doesn't sound very good we're just going to say he passes them over kind. right that's the russell conjugation what what do you think that means when he passes them over they're going to hell you think he yeah. doesn't know that and he decided that before they were ever born yeah yeah he decided it 
Yeah. It's he's making the decision and not based on foreknowledge. So Casey here is committing a he's contradicting the implications of Calvinism because God is by the act of electing not everyone. Yeah. He is so he is effectively damning them. Right. Yeah. He definitely is. I don't care how that sounds. That's just what it is. And if well, again, that's my problem with the seven point Calvinist. I'm going, you know, you're you're if you believe in total depravity, you're a seven point Calvinist. Yeah. Because if he passes over you, you have no hope without Christ. Well, at least they're honest though. A yeah. seven point count. Cal- well, I mean, yeah. they're not honest when they're trying to become a pastor of a church. We saw that. But yeah. at least when it comes to their doctrine, at least they admit that, yes, there is equal ultimacy. Yes, God does select some to damn them from before the foundation of the world, just as he selects some to say they at least admit that. So those that's are the consistent usually. Calvinists. Yeah, That's yeah. usually after they really, 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 very, really know that they are chosen. Yeah. Then they will say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, really, really very know that they are chosen. That's I want to put that in my new systematic theology. <laughs> That's, That's hilarious. Um, are we ready to keep going? Yeah, yeah. I don't know about y'all. I'm having fun with this. <laughs> I enjoy picking this stuff apart. So be careful not to charge a just God with injustice. Yeah, we're not charging a just God with injustice. We're charging a true God with being true. That's why we reject Calvinism. He's charging God of not having love. Say that again, Marcia. He's charging God of not being a God of love. Yeah, he's charging God of lying in 1 John 4, 8. The first, the foundation of the gospel is love, and he's removed all that. And that's the reason why the Westminster does not have God as love. It's been removed. Oh, wow. I didn't I didn't realize it had been removed. Well, it never was there. Yeah. No, oh, okay. I got God you. is love. It's not there. It's God I is thought death. you might be referring, because there's a couple different versions of it, even though they both came out of the 1600s, or I think maybe one of them came out a little later. But um, they're still like 300 years old. And I thought maybe they removed something like that out of one of the versions. No, it was never there. So, here we go. Embrace this doctrine to the fullest extent for which the Bible... Hold on, I want to hear this whole sentence. I want to back it up. We're at 1928. Let's go to 1910. He's about, he's embraced this doctrine. When you hear him say this, it's going to be coupled with a moral implication for not embracing it. Like you're 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 either immoral or inept if you don't embrace it. That's what's coming next because that's how ideologues talk. Active work is only to save. His active work is not to destroy. Praise God that He saves anybody. Oh, see, see, praise God that He saves anybody. You, you're the proper response. Anytime someone's telling you the proper response to something, it's moralistic, not epistemic. Yeah. And so you should be thankful that He chose somebody. Even just though happy, he just lied. Be happy that you're one of them. Say again, Debbie. Be happy that you're one of them. Yeah, yeah. Although I don't yeah. see how they really know, but. Be happy and thankful. That's the proper response because I'm yeah. an ideologue. So be careful. Yeah, there's no way for them to know. To charge a just God with injustice. If you do not embrace this doctrine to the fullest extent for which the Bible makes clear you are, in fact, charging a just God with injustice. What well, I tell you, moralism. You, mm-hmm. If you don't embrace this doctrine, you are morally wrong. You are charging God. You are committing the immoral act of charging God with injustice. But no. No. It has nothing to do with justice. It has to do with Scripture being true. And he's acting like the charge of injustice is the only reason to reject the Augustinian doctrine of election. That's not the only reason to reject it. We reject it because Scripture is true. It has nothing to do with whether or not we think God is fair. It nothing to do with that at all. And so it's a, it's a misnomer to pin that on on his opponents, if you will, theological people who disagree with him. And I'm asking you, embrace this doctrine by faith. Believe it. 
This is something that doctrine. There's no doctrine of election in the Bible. Requires folks to come to terms with. One of our own said here recently, when you first get saved, you're an Arminian. And then when you get sanctified, you're a Calvinist. <laughs> You like that one? That's the stupidest <laughs> thing I've ever heard. That's the that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> now, I will say that when I, in my early Christian life, I did think Armenian in Armenian ways, and then I became a Calvinist, but that was an apostasy. And then when I came out of Calvinism, I recognized that Arminianism and Calvinism were the same thing, and both to be rejected. And so for him to think that becoming a Calvinist and look at that, look at that smile on his yeah, face. Look <laughs> at that. It's like, that's, a like that's like the face of Simba when he's abdicating his responsibility back at the kingdom and letting pride rock go to hell in a handbasket under scar. <laughs> that's, that's the same kind of face. It, this is a court jester. When you're sanctified, did I say that right? When you first get saved, you're an Arminian. And then when you get sanctified, you're a Calvinist. What are you saying by that? Well, now if you were, let's, let me tell you this. I was, I was an officer in the army. And when you wear rank in the army, there are certain, you, you kind of lose the privilege to joke with soldiers. And the reason is because what you say carries weight with people. And you can't just joke around with people. You can't. You know, and I learned I learned some of that um, through experience. But what he's if if you're sitting at the pub with your buddies and you're having a beer and some chicken wings and you say this, that's kind of funny. It's a joke. But to be the pastor of a church and to say this to people is reprehensibly irresponsible misuse and abuse of the pastoral position and the pastoral authority. It's absolutely unforgivable. And that is not the way to talk to people. It, it, that is an abuse of the pastoral position to say something that would be a throwaway joke while you're eating chicken wings with your buddy yeah. uh, and actually say it from the pulpit while you're while you're trying to shove this doctrine moralistically down people's throats mm -hmm. yeah. with no epistemic reason for doing it. Yeah. This guy this guy is just you think he's a Calvinist, Kevin? I can tell he's a Calvinist by his lying, yeah. uh, but he also says Calvinist things. Yeah. <laughs> you tell them, you spot them by their fruit, by their inconsistencies, contradictions, willingness to lie, and moralistic bloviating. But every once in a while, I also hear uh, Calvinistic doctrine, too. But the other reasons are how we know he's a Calvinist. Yeah, and he continued to tell them he wasn't. Yeah, he's lying through his false teeth. Which is what they do. I mean, it's. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna stop sharing it because this is important to me. And like, I would say this to Layton's face, and he knows it. We we have that, but when we have that conversation the other day, I. I do not see things like he does. Um. He. He testified to knowing Calvinists that are, honest and forthright and play fair. This kind of thing, and. I, because, I, you know, I think 99.9% .9 of Calvinists give the rest of them a bad name. It's like, it's like, in order for someone to think that Calvinists aren't deceptive with everything they do and say, you kind of have to be self-deceptive just to be a Calvinist to begin with, which is a very flawed data processor. And so for someone to think that there are nice and honest Calvinists, as a rule of thumb, seems extremely naive to me. Yeah. Like you're and you're too, overlooking the nature of Calvinists. Yeah, yeah. We're all excited about the um the gospel. And so you're gonna want to share the truth of what you believe. So it automatically, if you're in a church and you have Calvinists in there, they're gonna want to share the gospel the way that they see it. Yeah. Well, your conference the other day or your podcast was, is Calvinism a false gospel? Mm. Was that 
the title. Yeah, the one uh, is Calvinism and Another yeah. Gospel. And I was I very think disappointed the in Leighton Flowers. Conversation really with uh, Leighton, yeah. Yeah, he never answered the question. And, and, you know, I have a problem with that. Paul said, I know what I believe. And your faith and your testimony is based on what you believe about God. If you are wishy-washy, you're you're standing in a unstable. The Bible, you know, Jesus talked about that, being unstable. If you're unstable in what you believe in, you're unstable in all your ways. Yeah. Well, it's because, impossible to be a stage three Christian without, or a fundamentalist really without being unstable. Double-minded man is unstable in those, yeah, all those ways. Mm-hmm. Your virtue yeah. signaling a particular thing, which is not genuinely what you are. Yeah. And, you know, and I, I used to say this to my women, and a lot of people think this is horrible to say, but I said, you know, in, in, in one day in heaven, Hitler's going to be better off than some Christians. Because when you bring up Hitler's name, you know to expect evil. Yeah. You know that he is known for exactly what he stood for. He was an evil man. Well, you get some people, you don't know where they stand. They're like Calvinists. They say one thing, then they say another thing, and you're like, kind of like with James Ross. James yeah. Ross, what is sovereign to you? Does it mean determinism? What does it mean? He never would answer, but yet the night we got removed, he gave what he called a clear answer, which is not, you know, what he said is not scriptural, um, you know, so he, but he gave Debbie a clear answer. Yeah. It, it Finally, after three years, yeah. five years. After three years. Yeah. yeah. And that definition didn't fit with the sermon. But, you know, the thing of it is, is what you believe is where you're going to be standing on one day. And it's only going to be you and God standing there. And I just, I, I get frustrated when I hear people that want to represent something or talk about their faith and they're all over the place. Well, no wonder our country's in bad shape. Because your country is um, going to reflect your religion. Your country is going to reflect your pulpits. Today, we got churches being destroyed from the inside out. Our country's being destroyed from the inside out. Why? Yeah. yeah. You know, in Revelations, it says, before it mentions the unbeliever will not enter heaven, before that, it says the coward. Why is that? Oh, wow. And, and I've wondered about that. You'll the pray fearful that all the time. And God showed me that if you're a coward, you don't believe in it. You won't speak up because you're a coward. You have no faith in it. You have no faith in him. So right now, these pastors, SBC pastors, are going to a convention. They're allowing nine marks to teach there. Mark Devers, who's a liar, he's teaching pastors to lie. Mm -hmm. And if these pastors don't show up in this convention and they stand up and ask for his removal, then you are going to be judged with the wicked. And it's just that simple. And that's why I'm sitting here today. So um, Revelation 21.8. Now I have the King James says uh, fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers. The ESV has this, uh, the cowardly, this word you just, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable is for the murders, and it goes on like that. Um, that is that is pretty intense. Um, you wouldn't want to be a coward. That that would say a lot. For, there's a lot of uh, stealth Calvinism going on in a lot of churches, and you guys are are a rare breed as far as people who are willing to stand up. Now that conversation that I had with Layton, he went on. You know his his answer was essentially like, well. These are kind of my words, but he's like, there's the presentation of Calvinism and they don't realize the implication. I'm like, but the implication is so obvious that if you're dealing with somebody that doesn't connect that implication, there's something cognitively wrong with them. Yeah. You see, there's, there's like, if you can't draw that cognitive line and the Calvinist thinks it's a bridge too far to recognize there's no gospel in Calvinism... There's something not, you know, the wheels aren't spinning upstairs. They're, they're a French fry short of a Happy Meal, you know? It's... Well, you know, people are going to hell because of this. You know, if, you, if you're sitting your foots in the round with what the gospel is, 
I mean, that's almost as bad as, uh, am I a girl? Am I a boy? I really don't know what I am, you know? Well, somebody we in the got... comment section asked a really good question. Um, Ver Veritax said, why implore them to believe? I mean, if you really believe Calvinism was true, you know, meticulous determinism, the R.C. Sproul and all this, if God is determining whatsoever comes to pass, you would just have to present the facts of Calvinism. Why do you have to use moralistic manipulation to try to convince people to believe? Yeah, yeah. It, it, the fact that he is employing moralistic manipulation to deceive people to be persuaded of Calvinism performatively contradicts his own belief in it mm -hmm. because he is, instead of relying on the Holy spirit to convince the elect that Calvinism is true, he knows it's a bunch of BS and he knows that if he doesn't use moralistic manipulation, nobody's going to fall for it. So it's up to him whether or not they believe Calvinism. It's not up to God. Otherwise he wouldn't have to use manipulation and moralism. Yeah. Yeah. And he would take him to the Bible not to books, not to stories, not yeah. to all this emotional garbage. And again, Kevin, why, why when he was telling the story about the, the coup and why they took over, it was because they didn't want to grow. They, they weren't willing to change. You know, no, it was because of the Calvinism, but he never brings that up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the fact that he put um, reform on the gospel tracks that they given the illusion to anybody visiting their church that they are a reformed church. And what he's doing is trying to stack the church again, parallel with, with our world right now. Stack the courts, change the laws so you can get the yeah. laws changed. Yeah. Stack the deacons, stack the um elders, the members, so you can vote those people out who you don't want in there. That's exactly what he was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Calvinism is essentially a collection of a few slogans. You have the toga the the tulip, the five points there, and then you have a few other things associated with it. Um, like the sovereignty of God and certain things about predestination that aren't all. There's a few things that aren't captured in the tulip, but essentially it's a small collection of slogans. Yeah. And um Jordan Peterson points out that the the word the word slogan, and I forget what language it comes from, but it means cry of the dead. And what it means is the people who need to use slogans to say what they say, they no longer have a mind thinking of their own. Mm -hmm. They have outsourced it to a slogan. I was just having a conversation. I don't know if you were part of it, Debbie, when we were at that Airbnb with Jason Breda's house where, yeah. where everybody was gathered mm -hmm. around with me, you, Leighton and Alana and Nick and everybody else. But, um, I, I, I made the point like there, there were six of us standing there talking around the kitchen sink. And I said, with the six of us here for any given issue, whether it's atonement or whatever, we should have six different perspectives. But if you all, if you require that everyone believes a certain statement of faith, like provisionism or Calvinism in order to be part of the group, now we've got one perspective. I could have benefited from five other perspectives. Now there's only one. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's the cry of the dead. You, you, you give up the fact that you are a live thinking human being. You outsource all of your sense making to one central unified set of thoughts. And you no longer think. And if you do, you keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. So you are effectively dead. And the idea set is like this big zeitgeist. It's like this big ghost controlling all the people. It's like you have given embodiment to all the people to this set of demonic ideas, and it possesses them all like a demon. They're all demon-possessed, ideologically possessed, going around doing the bidding of the egregore ideology. And they no longer have any God-given image of God cognition of their own. They've just given it away. Yeah. To this thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, somebody uh super chatted one day, said, Amen, Kevin. He talks like this with so much going around us and with Israel. The Bible is clear. It's about faith, it's about belief. Thanks for the super chat one day. I appreciate that. 
Uh, speaking of super chats, by the way, if you enjoy what you get on this channel, feel free to support. The details are in the description below. Are we ready to go to the, more of this yeah, video? Ready. Yeah. Right. I got about 17 more minutes. And I apologize. We did get started a little bit late. If we go over a little bit, I think I'll survive. So it says. Here we go. Is that when you first get saved, you truly experientially believe I chose God. I mean, I believed in him. I repented. And that is true. It's your responsibility to repent and believe. But then as you grow and you study God's word, you see, well, it was from the foundation of the world. He did have all of this all planned out. And so now you embrace the doctrines of grace. You I hate that doctrines of grace is a Russell conjugation for a system that has no grace. It's, yeah. it's a Russell conjugation and it's a lie and it's gaslighting. Yeah. Because you, you I, it's like, I don't see grace in Calvinism. Well, then there must be something wrong with you. That's what gaslighting is. If you yeah. don't see their perspective because they're lying, they make it act, they make it act like something's wrong with you. Well, there's no mm -hmm. grace in Calvinism. We got a video with that title, by the way. All right. You see what theologians in the timeless past have written down. You because it's technical debt and because they're trying to use Russell conjugations to put lipstick on a pig see that this is true. You see that God is just, not unjust in doing this. And so this doctrine of grace, it displays God's glorious sovereignty, it promotes humility, it encourages evangelism, and it provides assurance to the believers. It does absolutely none of those things. It makes God a liar. You have no assurance. It discourages evangelism. It's, it's all gaslighting. It's yeah. like you're talking to a narcissistic, abusive spouse. <laughs> It's exactly, and so he's standing from behind the pulpit, borrowing the power of God to say all these false things. And when you question him, who are you to question God? Yeah, okay. It's the most narcissistic, man centered set of things you could possibly say, is what this guy, Casey Butner, is saying. I want you to listen to me as I read this hymn, and then we'll stand and sing it as we close. You stand and say, if I read this hymn. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I need a pill. I need a I need an aspirin or something. I got an ice pick. I'm over here beating my leg. No, I'm joking. <laughs> here, I got I got what I need right here. It's ice. Oh. Ice pack. For listening. This is what you need when you're listening to Calvinist talk. <laughs> what are y'all's comments on that so far? We pretty much discussed it all. Yeah, I, I guess so. It's, I'm just like, I don't know. Sometimes I stop because sometimes I'll comment on what Calvinism is when I'm not listening directly to what they're saying, and I'll ask, like, maybe I got, maybe I was a little hard on them. Maybe I went a little too far, and like, I, I can't go far enough with this guy. Yeah, you yeah. can't say enough. There's there's nothing you could say to measure up to the amount of deceit and moralistic bloviating and abuse of the pastoral role that this guy is exercising on people, not to mention the man-centeredness and the performative contradictions that just flow out of his mouth like the water through Niagara Falls. Yeah, yeah. All right, 7-Eleven? 7-Eleven. Here we go with 7-Eleven. From the Old Testament and the New Testament, how God used Pharaoh. Let's look at it from the New Testament in Romans chapter 9. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9, and let's see how God has chosen Pharaoh as one whom he would work through to establish his works. God is sovereign. In Romans chapter 9 and verse... <laughs> Where is that phrase coming from? God is sovereign. He's, he's yeah. okay. See how God would use God is sovereign. He just throws a, I'm gonna throw in a Calvinistic talking point between summarizing the text and turning to it. 14. It's going to be kind of conflicting in your mind. Somebody said in the comment <laughs> section, he's preparing you. 
Richard uh, Vanderhaar, Haar, Van, I'm not sure, Vanderhaar said, yes, Calvinism is a backloaded works gospel. Yeah. You don't it's have any insurance. Yeah. You don't have any assurance that you're one of the elect. So you're constantly having to work to prove to yourself, to relieve your anxiety of the fear that you might not be elect. Yeah. And, and that's, he's telling uh, you ahead of time. It's going to be conflicting. conflicting. Get ready for it. Yeah. Don't let your mind, you submit your mind to him. Now what he's saying, don't use your <laughs> mind. Don't conform your mind to Christ. Somebody asked in the comments, so why is this dude against provisionism? And so we have videos called What's Wrong with Provisionism. We also have videos on the futility of any systematic theology. And essentially, this WFXX Fox, that's the username, um, we, <laughs> sky is blue, yeah, we do not think that something that is static and propositionally normative is what God has in mind for people who should be following the way of Christ and not instead uh, replacing the way of Christ with a set of doctrines that we essentially worship through idolatry instead of following the way that is Christ. So we promote following the way that is Christ, not a static set of doctrines. Um, but we have several videos on that. So I'm not going to I'm not going to take the time to go through it here, but it is worth mentioning that we do have videos on that. So watch the futility of any systematic theology and our videos on provisionism. It works. God is sovereign. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 14. I backed it up a little bit. It's going to be kind of conflicting in your mind. He's telling you that in advance. It's going to be yeah. kind of conflicting in your mind. That's right. It's not conflicting in my mind. He believes something that conflicts the text. That's why. But nevertheless, God says, don't worry about it. I'm God. The hidden things are hidden. What he's saying is that don't worry about it. Calvinism is God. That's what he's That's essentially right. saying. You can't yeah. question Calvinism because you're essentially questioning God. Yeah. This is exactly what Doug Gustafson has been talking about on the channel, about how Calvinists borrow power from God. You question yeah. me, you're questioning God. That is yeah. so hubristic. And he's saying, don't think about it. Yeah. Don't question it. It's going to be conflicting, but don't don't question it. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me. Isn't that from like the Jungle Book? Trust me. Your mind, but nevertheless, God says, don't worry about it. I'm God. The hidden things are hidden because I've hidden them, Deuteronomy 29, 29. But the revealed things are yours to understand. That's but the revealed things uh, contradict Calvinism. Yeah. So what they do is they take a contradiction and they offload that contradiction into the hidden things. And I'm like, but the contradiction is with what's revealed. Yeah. That's the right. things that's been given to us and revealed to us. You're contradicting those. Yeah, right. This is this isn't even a clever. I, I want to know if there's anybody in Beulah Baptist Church. I want to know if there's anybody who thinks this is a good idea <laughs> who's falling for this i just can't believe somebody being that cognitively inept church on bayshore fell for it yeah and, we don't and, and, have and deacons it, that walked out we don't have deacons we've got um people that even know that james is a calvinist in fact we debbie tell them what you prior member James said. Yeah, a prior member said that they were going to James' previous church that he started, he planted, and they said that James Ross was teaching Calvinism, Reformed theology, while he was there, and that's why they were there. They remember, yeah. and they admit, oh. at, they admit at being a Calvinist, and they were there, and they said, under James Ross, that's what he was teaching. And they're all in, well, James said he didn't register our church at nine marks, and we believe him. <laughs> you know, um, Kevin, there was a, a guy who told me, he said, you know, Marsha, I believe what Calvinism is false. I believe it's a false gospel. And I admire you for standing up. But now this is when I went, 
to Rocky when I got removed from Rocky. He said, but I don't want to drag my kids through it. The other day I uh, saw his family. His son's now married. They got several kids. And guess what? They're all Calvinists. So I would yeah, love that's to what they're dragging that. his kid through. And um, those grandkids. Yes. His, his grand, his grandkids are going to, I'm not trying to speak ill over somebody's grandkids, but I'm saying that being in an ideology is not going to work out well for them. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. dividends that that sin gets worked down to the third and fourth generation, Exodus 34, and it will be paid for. Mm -hmm. that, I know parents that are not allowed to see their grandkids because yep. the, their, their children have said, because they lied to them, what James said, about your parents being good meaning, did not tell you correctly the gospel. Yep, and so these yep. kids feel like their parents lied to them. Mm -hmm. So now they're not allowing their, their kids to see their grandparents. Yeah. And I know of two families that are dealing with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's splitting families up. That's terrible. Yeah. So um, let me tell you something that used to happen that I noticed when I was a pastor. I was the pastor of... Uh, this I noticed this when I was a pastor of Skyline Baptist Church. If if I were to go sit down with somebody just like you, sit down at a coffee shop and have a conversation, we'd be able to have a conversation just fine. You'd be able to understand everything I'm trying to say. No doubt about it. As soon as I would stand behind the pulpit at church, I could say the exact same things that I said in the conversation. It's like the eyes glaze over, like they go into a different mode where it's like they they now take in data differently or not at all mm -hmm. something like that and so mm -hmm. it, it it's it's interesting that like you take there's some smart people that go to church i mean there's there's engineers there's people i've worked with i've, I've had in church who are uh designing helicopters and uh you know designing highways i mean i've had some really smart people who really have to work with data and know what they're talking about in the what you might call the secular world or in the real world and they like the data has to be right and it it can't be guessed it can't be fake but then for some reason when they come into church it's like they enter this different zone and this paul comes over them p a l l and suddenly their sense making that they're using when they're designing highways or designing helicopters just goes out the window and they start believing things for moral reasons or just going along with things that don't make sense. Now, if they went along with things that didn't make sense at work, people would die. Yeah. Yeah. And, but for some reason they step into a church, put a guy behind the pulpit and people just nod and go along with things. And there's like this, there's like a power of influence. There's a moralistic thrust that can be abused from behind a pulpit. People just don't listen. And like, so when he's well, saying this stuff, this stuff that's so such obvious, logical red flags, yeah, yeah. I just cannot believe that a person would just sit there and be okay with it. But, you know, Kevin, a lot of people are relying on a pastor to feed them, spoon feed them, these Bible studies to spoon feed them, rather than being alone with God and his word, experiencing God by prayer, you know, things like fulfillment of prayer being answered. And I've had a lot of that lately. Well, and, and fellowship seeing, and discernment. Yes. Those like you experience God through all these different ways. And then when you sit under this guy, I mean, really, if you look at all the warnings in scripture about all the false teachers, we should be more alert and uh, more suspicious mm -hmm. of these clowns than ever than anybody else. Mm -hmm. We should be more yeah. suspicious of these kinds of clowns than we are of the guys who are, you know, designing helicopters. That's for sure. Kevin, there was a guy when I was at Rocky, he he uh, stopped me one day and he said, now, Marsha, if you will meet with me, we'll get our Bibles and we'll open it up and I'll show you where you're wrong. And so he was talking about a lot of different things. And finally, I looked at him. I said, I'll tell you what, Mark, have you ever read your Bible all the way through? Now, this guy has got, uh, I don't remember if he, he didn't have a doctrine, but he had something in religion where he had gone to school 
Um, he was a leader. He was an elder. Master of he divinity or something classes, like that. Yeah. Taught classes and everything else. And I asked him, I said, have you ever read your Bible all the way through? And this was his answer. He said, Marsha, if you added up all my classes and my whatever it is he got, he goes, I'm sure that would be equal to the whole Bible. Mm. And I looked at him <laughs> I looked at him dumbfounded. I never did say another word to him. I let him finish talking and then I walked away and I thought, how in the world are you going to lead me when you don't know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the Bible is inexhaustible. And if you know anything, if you have any kind of relationship with God at all that is scripturally based, you know that you go read a passage of scripture and then a couple of years later, it seems like a completely different passage because you've grown so much and you see it so differently. And you would expect that scripture will continue doing this with you. You will continue to grow. You will continue seeing different, different things and more in scripture. And so to, to summarize to somebody that if you sat under all this stuff that's happened in the past, that's equivalent to the Bible. That's, that's somebody who does not understand anything about growth at all. Yeah. And who has Somebody never grown. Been deceived. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah, they think of growth as uh education. <laughs> filling your mind with encyclopedic yeah. data points. What yeah. what the Bible warns against. And there's nothing wrong with filling your mind with scripture, but they think that like filling your mind with certain truth claims equals that's the Bible. That's right. that's not the Bible at all. Right. And Kevin, you were saying, how, you know, how do people believe this? How do they believe these pastors? Mm -hmm. But like with our church, you know, if you if you have deacons or people on the search team that are choosing this pastor and everybody trusts them, these, these handful of deacons that Marsha and I were dealing with and them going to the 70 deacons to, you know, because we wanted to meet with them, their influence is great and people believe them. And in our church, you can look at, you know, all these different people in our church and they're going to look at, okay, here's Debbie and Marsha and here's all of these people. Here's our past pastor there and here's all these deacons that they trust and put in there. So who are they going to believe? Yeah, yeah. It's So that's that, um, that presumed authoritative belief, trust of these people. Yeah that frankly should not be trusted. So there's this gap. We have a big gap in the church. And um, Kyle in the comments said, first principles thinking is rare, even in helicopter design. But when you're working in regular areas, uh, let's say you're working in a grocery store. I mean, there's certain metrics by which your performance can be evaluated. You see, you get a performance evaluation at work. And if uh, like I do cybersecurity remediation. If I don't show that a, a chart that demonstrates that the remediation has been happening, I get fired. <laughs> you see, in other words, there's a, there's a touch point of the truth claim that I'm making. So when I say I'm going to remediate this, I can show it. And then we run the scans again and the stuff is remediated. And then that verifies my prediction that, what I said was going to happen, but with in the realm of religion and Christianity, there's so much stuff that's untouchable. There's so much stuff that's subjective. Oh, I have the Holy Spirit. You don't, I've been regenerated. You're not, I have, I have assurance and you don't, these doctrines have been a blessing to me and they probably really haven't. And then heaven, 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 who's been to heaven. I know the verse in Ephesians two, six, we're seated together with him in heavenly places, but Tell me who's been to heaven, right? So all these claims are referring to an ontology that nobody can touch because it's all metaphysical, to an afterlife to which nobody alive today has been because it's not here and it's not now, and to a bunch of claims that are subjective which nobody can touch. There is no, there is no way to go look at the outdated milk and yogurt on the shelf and tell somebody they haven't stocked the shelves like they should have. You see, mm -hmm. there's, there's no touch point to evaluate these guys and tell them that they're full of beans get down from the pulpit and people are afraid to do that yeah. and like you said marcia they're cowards mm -hmm. and they need to stand up and do it ah, i just can't believe that this people get away with this 
uh, it just makes me think it makes me think so little of the uh, cognitive capacity of the people who are willing to sit under people like this and think that that's okay. I mean, to sit under this guy you instead know, of having problem. him committed to the Mental Institute is well, not okay. Kevin, they'll lose their own family, just like the guy I told you about earlier. You know, you're you're not only responsible as a member of a church. You're responsible for your own home first. And, you know, and it's, it's like a toad Debbie, even with First Baptist. God is going to judge First Baptist. And yep. it, it's coming. They might as well, James might as well bend over and wait for the kicking because it's coming. Because he lied. The night he removed us, he knows he's a Calvinist. Mm -hmm. There's other members knows he is a Calvinist, and he accused us of, of of calling him a liar. Well, like I said, for me to call him anything else but a liar would make me a liar because I heard it coming out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. Right, and, right. So you get ostracized for being the one to tell the truth about the matter. Right. So again, you know, it's just a matter of time. And, you know, God's given him just like David. God gave David, before he sent Nathan, a year to repent. Your David, David went through burying um, um, Bathsheba's husband. Uh, what was his name? Uriah. Um, Uriah. Uriah. You know, I mean, could you imagine here the big thing of, you know, him coming home and how David probably catered to that and how many times he went to the temple in that year, but yet he had to sin before him. Finally, God sent Nathan and told him a story. And, uh, and David says, you know, real quickly, you know, that guy needs paid four times as much. And you look at David's life. And right. so God, yeah, God's been gracious. He's given them time to maybe see these tapes. But again, that Holy Spirit, I mean, the if nothing else, Romans 1 says your conscience, will either bear witness for you or against you. So if nothing else, their conscience is going to bear a witness against them because they did not care enough to know the truth. And they are sitting there supporting a man, some of them that they know is a liar. <clears throat> so um, I want to make something very clear. I want to, I'm trying to write this down before I lose the thought because I wanted to listen to what you were saying. And it, I'm very concerned about the way this kind of stuff affects families because it separates families. Yeah. And I can't get this through people's heads enough that it's not just Calvinism, but radical adherence to any static ideology. Like anything that comes in like something like this or something like this, anything that's a static set of doctrines where you have a doctrine of election, doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if you have the provisionist doctrine of election or the Calvinist doctrine of election. If you have a static set of doctrines and you are a radical adherent to that static set of doctrines, it will separate your family for the wrong reasons. Yeah. It'll separate friendships and social circles for the wrong reasons. Now I understand Jesus said, I, you know, some people come to bring peace, but I come to bring a sword. I understand that sometimes following the way of Christ means that you have to give up egoic attachments to your family. I understand that. And sometimes that happens and you can't avoid it when you follow the truth. But this is a simulacrum of that. This is not the truth. This is an unnecessary split in families and social circles and friend groups that does not need to happen. And it is a characteristic of, and it's not unique to Calvinism. It's a characteristic of any time in history that there is radical adherence to a static propositional data set or a system or a paradigm. Yeah. That's the fruit of it. It splits things up. It causes turmoil and division unnecessarily not the good kind of division because somebody's standing for the truth but the bad kind yeah. and that's what that's what this is and it's unavoidable and it's you know the people who are provisionists now it's a it's a young movement but what they don't realize is that if it persists in a hundred years 
it's going to be doing the exact same things to families that this is. It's mm-hmm. purity hunts. Oh, you're not as good of a provisionist as I am because blah, 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 blah. And it's any, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the data set is. When you're following a data set instead of the way that is Christ, this always happens. I have a chart mm-hmm. on the problems with ideology. And there's like 30 things on the chart and they're unavoidable. Doesn't matter what the content of the ideology is. Somebody asked. Kevin, that's like James. He was preaching a sermon and he made the statement. He said, now if you're here today, God has drawn you here and you may be chosen. Well, you know, what about repentance? You know, if somebody comes into the kingdom just for the fact that they've been chosen and like, um, like last week when he had, what is it? Sola scripture, whatever that's called. What's it called? Sola scriptura. Yes. Where repentance is number three when Jesus, and again, you've got. Oh, the, the ordo salutis. Yes, oh, yeah. order salute, yeah, order salute. Where um, repentance is number three, where Jesus and John the Baptist's words were repent and be baptized. Yeah. Repent. See, they want to dismantle the the, the uh, sinner's prayer. Well, repentance, Jesus said, repent and be baptized. Repentance is saying, Lord, I'm a I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a savior. And bat and being baptized to to make that public, and so again the Calvinists have undermined the sinner's prayer mainly because you can't preach you're chosen in any of that, and yeah, so yeah. it's a manipulation of truth and truth divides. The problem it's is a, that a it's a Gnostic divides. awakening. They don't believe in biblical conversion to Christianity or to Christ. They they it's essentially a Gnostic awakening. You've always been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And you just have, we have the magic words to wake you up to it. Yeah, right. And then your repentance is a, uh, it's a Back gift in response to regeneration. Yeah. Yeah. They have, they have all Jesus. the post hoc rationalizations for it, but that's all they are. None of Calvinism comes from scripture. It's all post hoc rationalizations of the paradigm. Uh, trying to explain scripture away. Calvinism is clever, clever reasons for why scripture is not true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that point about repentance, that's they start off with repentance. And it's the same old thing. And they've got post hoc rationalizations for this too, but it's kind of dumb to tell people who to repent who can't repent unless you make them. Right. That's, <laughs> that's right. the dumbest thing ever. Mm-hmm. What? So in other words, once you're a Calvinist, you realize that that's all a charade and it's all a put on and it's not a good faith effort offer. Right. But they tell you it's not a contradiction. Yeah. And Kevin, again, people, you know, if, if somebody's gone to hell because you being a pastor or being a Christian is not sharing truth with them. It's like a young girl a few weeks ago, I took some food up to the hospital and there was this young girl sitting there and I was talking to her and it was going through my mind. Should I share the gospel with her? We talked about a lot of things and I left there and I didn't share the gospel with her. They had her funeral last week. Let me tell you something. It's serious. Yeah. Waiting flowers. It's serious. When you sit there and you waver and you don't give a clear answer, then perhaps you need to go back to the Bible and come back with a clear answer. And I know he's a friend of yours, but I tell you what, it made me sick when I listened to that. We have a good relationship. We we both know that we disagree and we're okay with it, which is, I think, where people should be. We should be able to disagree and still be okay. I'm not, I'm not particularly okay with that thing, which is why I disagree about it, but he, I, I can voice my opinion and it's not going to hurt his feelings. He's got, he's got thick enough skin and he's, he's a big boy. <laughs> he can, he can take what some disagreement. People need to be clear about what they believe and not, you know, not, well, this is what I'm going to tell you this, but this is really what I'm saying. You know, right, I, right. I'm talking about sovereign God rules. But I really mean he determines everything. This is what I'm saying. If, if if people are not very clear about what they believe, you don't know that person that you've entertained. It's no different than James with the one with the guy that was caught in adultery. 
and he never did offer him any clear biblical counsel. And yeah. got up from the table and the guy says, well, aren't you going to say anything? He goes, you have spit in the face of a holy God. That's what he told him. And I thought, okay, where's the biblical counsel? You know, even Nathan came to David with biblical counsel. David said, you know what? I may not see my son on this side, but I will see him again. You know, so again, there's a lot of failure when you're not clear about what you believe. And if you're a Christian and should be evangelizing, that's just not the church. If you're a Christian, you should be evangelizing and sharing the gospel. And, you know, again, if you're not clear what the gospel is, then how can you share it? Again, that's my problem. I'll share oh, That's that. very well said. No, <laughs> that's well said. On. I'll be quiet. We're... <laughs> We're um we're past time, but I think that's a really great thing to end on. Is um what it really all boils down to is the gospel, and if it, Calvinism is not some peripheral thing that's a non-essential, it hits to the heart of who Jesus is. Uh, Calvinism has a Jesus that did not die for all. Second mm -hmm. Corinthians five fourteen through fifteen has a Christ that did die for all. It's a different Christ. It's a it different is. Jesus. Right. I'm not making a statement about adherence to Calvinism, and I'm not making a proclamation over the status of their salvation. What I'm saying is that it's two different data sets. What's in mm -hmm. Scripture and what's in Calvinism is two different things. It's yeah. two different Jesuses. It's two different Gospels. They're not the same. I can tell that for the same reason that I can tell that peas aren't carrots. Right. It's not a moralistic statement. I'm not condemning anybody. They're just different. Right. Well, yeah. Kevin, even the Holy Spirit goes and, you know, awakens some, you know, and not others. So even the Holy Spirit is different. Yeah, that's Very right. Amazing. The Holy Spirit's different also, mm -hmm. as is God the Father. Right. Um, last comments uh, from you before we do this again. Uh, Marsha and Debbie. Um Thanks so much again for coming on. What are your final thoughts before we end this session? Well, basically, Kevin, again, why we were doing this is because Casey Butner said he was not a Calvinist. And he they ran these people out of the, their own church say, and continued to tell them that he was not. And when they tried to stand up and do things right, according to the bylaws, then, you know, Silvestro got up there up on the stage and just started pointing fingers and screaming at them. And, um, you know, when really they were right, they were trying to do things right. They were not being mean. They just didn't want to go Calvinist. And he continued to say he wasn't. And we're, Marcia and I are just trying to show that he is. Yeah. Yeah. And they did this. Uh, one of the things too, is they had agreed upon on how they would proceed mm -hmm. and, Casey did not honor his word. Correct. They had agreed to bring it before the church and they stormed the stage, would not let them speak, turned off their mics. Right. And right. using a form of bullying. And the week before this, Casey did an hour and 40 minutes sermon, mm -hmm. wanting people to tell them what he thought about the church, what they thought about the church were really what he wanted was them to tell about how great he was because people came up to give their testimony that was already written out. Right. So it was prearranged or they would have never had wrote out testimonies. Yeah. He tried to say, you have, you know, you have a voice here. I want to hear what you have to say, but he had already told certain people and they all had it written down, but you'll see more of that when we, as yeah. we go along. Yeah. So that's another... a lot of, it's another manner of deception, performing yeah. deception. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Hey, Kevin, I love Leighton Flowers. I hope I wasn't being. No, you got to speak your mind. No, I, th I think he understands that, you know, <laughs> I'm just, There's... I'm just, Hey, if me and my, my brother, my sister-in-law, we get together a lot and have a lot of conversations and my dad on the porch, sometimes we get pretty heated over what, different ones of us but we love we'll sit out there with a cup of coffee for hours and talk about the bible yeah so uh, like calvinists you can't question them because it's questioning god but mm -hmm. layton is a nice kind person who loves the lord and he likes to be questioned and challenged and um we, we kind of thrive on that thing we expect to have disagreements and things like that so it's um 
we're allowed to question each other and that's kind of what makes us better. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about offending him because he's a big boy. He's got thick skin and he likes the different ideas. I've talked to him about this and um, I'm, I'm happy to have those conversations with him. I think it's a good thing. So I don't, don't feel like you have to hold back for him because he actually, he actually thrives on when people disagree. He, I, I think he's earnest and he's willing to take a second look at things and be challenged and prompted to, you know, what should be my angle on this? So, yes, I wouldn't worry about uh, where he is. He's not going to hate you or anything like that. He's one of the most well, gracious people that I, I know. <laughs> I'm not taking back <laughs> no. what I said. I'm just saying that, you know, I didn't mean to go on about it. You right. Know I got you. Know. Yeah. So I want to, and I'm going to say this to you too. I'm also going to say this to the audience. Um we got a comment in here that says redeemed rogue molecules. That's, that's his, uh, user handle. He says my SBC pastor went full Calvi this Sunday. I w I'm in the middle of revamping the website right now. And I want to put together a directory of all the stealth Calvinist churches that are out there. And so if anybody knows of a church that is stealth Calvinist, and what I mean by that is two things. Somebody has infiltrated a Calvinist church and they're trying to a non-Calvinist church and they're trying to turn it into a Calvinist church. Or if you were to attend a church, it's not very clear whether or not it's Calvinist and you might attend for five years before you find out. Mm -hmm. I'm not looking for lists. I'm not looking for churches that say reformed on the sign or that are obviously Calvinistic. I think they're honest. That's fine. If you're honestly Calvinistic, great. I'm talking about, uh, Crypto Calvinists, stealth Calvinists, whether the church is stealth Calvinist and brings people in and doesn't tell people, or whether uh, there's a Calvinist infiltrator, I want to build a directory of where this is happening so people can come to the website, look at the directory, and see if their church or one nearby or one that they're considering visiting or joining is on the list or should be, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um we have a super chat from Caleb who says, Hey y'all, it was nice to meet you and Debbie. Keep up the great worry. That's Caleb from uh Saturday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Caleb just I, gave I a enjoyed super talking chat. to Thanks. him very much. <laughs> Thanks, Caleb, for the super great chat. Guys. Appreciate that. Um We didn't get then, very uh, far, Kevin. Say again? <laughs> we didn't get very far. No, we didn't, but I think we covered a lot of information that's very useful, yeah. especially for the people who may like if Beulah Baptist Church can get get rid of this guy and get back to the Bible. Yeah. That would be fantastic. And this may prompt that. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. The hard part is the hard part is Kevin. And, and I think we might've mentioned this last week is that if he had a problem with people that were questioning him, he would kind of build a ruckus around them and gradually get them out. You know, like yeah. letting go of a, a of one of the deacons and saying, "Well, your wife doesn't come, your son doesn't come. You know, you can no longer be a deacon." He'll find a way to get yeah. them out. So, um, yeah. the the member that told us said, for every you know new couple coming in, he would chase another couple off. He was stacking, so, yeah, stacking the Calvinist. Yeah, yeah. Ch changing the composition yeah. to right. a Calvinist composition of the church. Right. Exactly. All right. Well, let's let's schedule our next one soon so we can yeah. keep going through this data and let's not uh yeah, let's not let's keep the momentum going, not lose the momentum on this. But thanks thanks so much for all your hard work organizing all these files, taking the time to sit here with uh me and the audience to talk through this. Uh it's very valuable for the body of Christ in my opinion and you guys are troopers. I, I so appreciate you guys and I hear nothing but positive things. There's so many people that are thankful for what you're doing. Mm. So Thank I you, appreciate you guys you having us. Yeah. All right. So let's set that up soon. Okay. And uh, thank you and have a wonderful Monday. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you right. too. Bye. Bye. And um, to everybody else that's still out there, if you're still watching, thanks for what you're doing. There's so much that I want to do. I have, I have lists and lists of things that I want to do on the channel. Um, people I want to have conversations with content that I want to create. Honestly, I just don't have, I, I, I can't afford to take the time to create the content, to do the research, to put the information together that I want to make available to you, to, to 
put the website like I want it for you. You just can't afford to take the time to do it. If you believe in what we're doing here at Beyond the Fundamentals and you want us to see us bolster it up to everything that it could be, please consider supporting the channel. Details are in the description below or at the donation link on the website, which is also under revision, but it'll be the same, same information when it's updated. So thank you so much. And